Hey, welcome back everybody and welcome to our online students. Today what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at the polarity of molecules. We have talked a little bit just briefly on what makes something a polar bond. And that has something to do with the electronegativity of elements. So how much does one element want electrons versus another? And today what we're going to do is we're going to expand that out and take a look at whole molecules, whether or not molecules themselves are polar. Now to get us started here, we have a molecule. This one here is called transdichloroethylene. Now this, the name may not mean anything to you and that's okay. This is organic chemistry and for those of you that, that stick around chemistry long enough, you may end up taking this class. But for right now, this is called transdichloroethylene. And, and, and what does that mean? It means that we have ethylene, which is two carbons, carbon, carbon, two carbons, double bonded. And then trans, that is to say that we've got chlorines on opposite sides here like this, like this and like this. So chlorine above, chlorine below. This is what makes a trans. Now that's not going to be on a test or anything until you take organic chemistry. Just letting you know where these words come from. Now the question is here, uh, it says dipole moments can be used to distinguish between structural isomers and we're trying to figure out whether or not this is a polar molecule. Now these atoms on our on, on this molecule here have different electronegativities. That is to say they have different degrees of wanting electrons. And, and when we take a look at our periodic table, if we had a periodic table that looked like this, oh, that's a mighty fine periodic table. Yeah, don't laugh. No, I'd laugh, I'd totally laugh at that. Okay, so there's my periodic table. Now some of these elements have greater electronegativities than do others. Some want electrons more than others. And so as, as we point on our periodic table, right, this is gonna be, this is gonna be like dance team, okay? Da, 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 da. Okay, so your turn. Point, what direction on the periodic table has greatest electronegativity? No, you're pointing the, oh yeah, yes. <laughs> Yes, yes, up in this upper right hand corner here. So as we go this way, these elements here have the greatest electronegativity. That is to say they want electrons the most. It also happens to co coincide with the sizes of the atoms. These ones here are smaller, so those electrons are closer to the nucleus, they have a tighter pull. So these ones here tend to want electrons more than do the ones down here, so, so nicely done. So, Electronegativity, uh, if I can spell that, I'm going to say e electronegativity, electronegativity. I think that, I think that's good. You're just kind of shaking your head. Oh. Is that, is that spelled okay? Okay, Whew. all right, good. Made it through spell check. So on, our, uh, on this molecule here, some of these are gonna want electrons more than others. And, and so these ones here, the chlorines, chlorines want electrons more than do the carbons, than do the hydrogens, because chlorine is further over this way. And so these chlorines are going to be electronegative and electronegative. It's like a little S here type symbol and a minus sign. That, that's where the charges now are going to be. And that, that's gonna pull the electrons towards the chlorines, which makes these carbons a little bit electropositive. Electropositive, like this. Now the question is, do we have polar bonds here? Are there polar bonds in this molecule? Yep, unequal distribution of electrons. There are polar bonds in this molecule. But is the molecule itself polar? The whole overall molecule, is it polar? And the answer is no. The answer is no. So if we were to draw force lines, now physics people like to do this. Physics people like to draw vectors. Like they like to go, well, if I have a semi truck going this way and I have a Volkswagen Jetta going this way and they hit each other and this car ends up in the ditch, they draw force lines, vectors. Same sort of thing here is we're gonna draw force lines. We're gonna say that the electrons are going towards these chlorine atoms like this 
and like this. So we have an arrow pointing in the direction that the electrons are going, and then this positive end here shows which side's positive, and then which side the electrons are going. Now these force lines, if I drew it, if I did a good job drawing this, they'd be equal and opposite here, and they cancel each other out. So if they cancel each other out, that makes this nonpolar. Nonpolar molecule. Nonpolar molecule, even though we do have a polar bond. So I'm just, I'm just imagining a great test type question. Can a molecule with a polar bond be nonpolar? Yes. Yes, it can. Yes, it can. Nicely done. Now, if we took this molecule and we flip flopped it, we twisted it so that the chlorine is up here, then this would be what we call cis dichloroethylene. That is to say that the two chlorine atoms are on the same side. And if we do that and we were to draw our force lines or our vectors, we'd see now that they do not cancel each other out. They do not cancel each other out, so that makes this molecule polar. It's the same atoms, they're just arranged differently. And now this one's polar. Any questions on that? Okay. Now, there's some molecules that we recognize as being polar. Water is one of them. And so water has this structure where it is like this. We've got oxygen and we've got a couple of hydrogens like this, okay? And then we've got two lone pairs, and one lone pair might be coming out of the board like this, and one going away from us like that. And we would say that our vectors are going in generally in this direction like this. That is to say the electrons are being pulled to one side of the molecule versus another, so we say that water is polar. Water is a polar molecule. Now, this is nonpolar. Would this nonpolar molecule be soluble in water? No. Yeah, have you heard of the phrase like dissolves like? Yeah. So polar molecules dissolve polar molecules, are, 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 are soluble in polar molecules. So then here's a question for you. Isopropanol, that's the fancy term for rubbing alcohol. Isopropyl alcohol. And there is kind of a rough structure there. This is how organic chemists might draw it. It's being a little bit lazy because it's missing a few things, but I'm going to draw it here. I'm going to go here and say carbon like this, CH3, um, CH3, and then over here I'm going to go OH like this, and then there'd be a hydrogen down here. And we might recognize, oh, here's that oxygen, there's a hydrogen, looks something like this here. We're going to have a couple of lone pairs, one going like this, and then one going like that. And so that creates a net dipole here, like this. We have an unequal distribution of electrons. So is isopropyl alcohol polar? And the answer is yes. This is polar. This is polar. So, would isopropyl alcohol be soluble in water? Yeah, they're both polar. Like dissolves like. Excellent. Nicely done. Now, I'm going to show you another molecule here. This one's a little messier. This one's called cellulose. And biology people, you might recognize this one. This is the stuff that makes cell walls. This is what makes plants um, um, fibrous and, and rigid. And this structure here, don't worry about drawing this. This is not going to be like, on the test, draw me a molecule of cellulose. Nope, nope, not, that's not until you take biochemistry. So here's cellulose. Notice all of the oxygen atoms on there. There's lots of oxygen atoms. There's OHs on there. This, is, this has got polar molecule elements, these, these, these things here are, there's this polarity, there's an unequal distribution of electrons. So then the question is, would this be sticky to water? 
And the answer is yes. Have you ever used a cotton towel? Cotton is cellulose. Cotton holds on to water. If you ever go camping, sometimes they say cotton is rotten. It's not, and the reason behind this is if you wear cotton clothing when you're outside and such and it gets wet, it takes a long time to dry because it really holds on to water. Now, this creates an opportunity for us. Um, this is the point in the lecture where I ask people for money. Does anybody here have any, any paper money? Seriously, does anybody have any paper money? Yeah. And I promise I'll give it back. Yes, okay, if you've got paper money, I just need a, a thing of paper money. Okay, perfect. All right, okay. All right, thank you very much. And I promise I will give this back to you. Okay, you're, you're, you're my witnesses, okay? Because asking students for bribes in the middle of lecture is apparently frowned upon for tenure. Now, what I did before class is I took some isopropyl alcohol and I mixed it with water. And I was curious as to whether or not, I was curious as to whether or not the isopropyl alcohol or the water is more polar. And so I thought I'll do a test. I'm gonna take the, the cellulose, because it's made out of cotton, and I'm going to take my alcohol and water here and squirt it all over George. George is getting a shower. Okay, there we are, George. And we're just gonna flip George over here. Maybe he doesn't wanna see what's coming. There we go. All right, that looks pretty good. All right, there we go. Yeah, that's, okay, that is one wet dollar bill. There we go. Now, I'm gonna try here if this works. If this works is, is, George. George and I have gone, we've got a long history. He doesn't spend much time in my house. I wish he did, but here we go. Okay. Let's see what happens here. Nice and juicy. Okay. Okay, so there was some there was some fire there. There was some fire. Now this bill is still wet. And you saw fire, but the bill did not burn. And the way that we try to explain this is that the isopropyl alcohol burned, right? Water doesn't burn unless you're doing something wrong. Right? So it was the isopropyl alcohol that burned, but the dollar bill didn't. And we think that the reason this works is that the water sticks to the cellulose because it is more polar than the isopropyl alcohol. So this is a kind of a way of separating your alcohol from, from your water, okay? Like if you're really desperate for water. <laughs> okay, don't drink isopropyl alcohol, it's bad for you. Okay, um, and then you end up with a wet dollar bill. Now if you ever try this trick at home, um, make sure you don't have anything flammable nearby and if you let this go long enough, what happens is, is the heat will eventually evaporate the water off of the dollar bill and your dollar bill will eventually burn. And so you know, at a certain point, you might wanna give it a little shake there um, and, and get rid of the, the flames. So there you go. Thank you very much for sharing. Um, and, and just to double check, I gave you back a $1 bill, right? Okay, yeah, I'm sorry. Right. <laughs> this is not magic. So. Um, all right, so there's, there's cellulose. You saw that, that's very sticky to water. I'm gonna show you a similar molecule here. This one is hyaluronic acid. And hyaluronic acid has a ring structure like cellulose does. There's lots of oxygens and OHs and such on there. It's kind of a similar-ish looking molecule. And so the question is, do you suppose this molecule here is sticky to water? Yeah, it is. It is very sticky to water. So where, why would you use this one? So this is something, so my, my wife, my wife is an ear, nose, and throat um, uh, provider, and one of the things she does is, is she will take needles and stick needles in people's faces with 
hyaluronic acid. And I thought, well, that's, that sounds like something the CIA does in like back, you know, I don't know, dark room somewhere, right? So what's the deal with that? So she showed me this picture and she says, well, what, what do you notice about this picture? Say, well, I, I guess they're twins. Can you tell a difference? I couldn't tell a difference. Anybody see what the difference is here? Anybody see a difference? Yeah, what, what do you see? Wow, okay, so you notice that the, the one on the right seems a little lighter in color. You're seeing that, okay. And that could be a lighting thing, I, I don't know. Could be. Anything else, anybody notice anything else? Yeah. The smile lines on the picture on the right are gone. Yeah, and that's, that's where she makes her money. And so what she does is she'll take a needle with this hyaluronic acid and inject it on the nasal labial crease. Nasal labial crease. Okay, it's, it's the line between the nose and the edge of the mouth. And, and so this molecule, the, the injected in there, it soaks up water and plumps it up and then it makes the, the, the line there go away. Yeah, that, that's exactly what it is. And so this, is, this gets rid of wrinkles. Now hyaluronic acid is, is naturally produced by all of us. We all produce it, it's all in our skin, but as we age, it tends to break down and, and we tend to lose it. And so over time then, that's one of the reasons, there's others, that's one of the reasons we get wrinkles. And so this is a treatment for this, it's just using chemistry to make lots of money. I'm not passing judgment on why people do this, I'm <laughs> just saying it's a thing. All right. Uh, okay, so here's a molecule. This is cis dibromoethylene. Is this a polar molecule? And then would it be soluble in water? Yes. So this is a polar molecule. The electrons are going to be pulled up towards the bromine atoms. They're not equal and opposite, so they don't cancel out. That makes this a polar molecule, and because it's a polar molecule, we suspect it should be soluble in water. So, dang, you can look at a molecule now and tell whether or not it would be sticky to water without actually sticking it in water, without having to ask somebody for money. Okay, now, use this newfound superpower for good. 